Okay, good evening everyone and uh, happy Sabbath and welcome to our online interactive Bible study. Uh, we are back live today. Unlike our previous weeks, we had to do pre-recording, but we managed to get enough of everyone um, on board that would not be affected with load shedding. But uh, we are excited. We've got our panelists with us and um, we know that you are going to be blessed. But before we continue, let us just close our eyes for a word of prayer. Our kind and gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much that we can come into your presence. We know, Lord, that um, it's been a, a, a busy week, but we do pray, Lord, for the peace uh, that passes all understanding. We pray, Father, that the peace of Christ may be found in us. May we have the rest that we so dearly uh, seek. We also ask, Lord, that you may be with every panelist, every viewer. And may today's message, Lord, change the trajectory of our lives. May it be, Father, at this Sabbath school, um, lesson study may give us the necessary comfort we need uh, for the times that we are living in. Bless us now, Lord, for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was uh, truly moved by um, the lesson study. And I must say, as I said last week, it's a very practical lesson study. And the lesson study seems to speak deeper than the mind. It actually reaches the heart and um, brings comfort and um, I don't know how many of us are going through crisis or crises, but I'm sure that um, those viewing can truly find comfort from, from the lessons. I would like to, normally I would share what I, you know, have, have received from the lesson study, but there's this nice story that Alan White gives to us called The Birdcage. And really, uh, the, the lesson study opens with a story. And for the first time, I'm going to read it, all right? Um, and so that we can just get some, some encouragement. So in Sabbath's portion of the lesson, um, uh, Ellen White gives this in the Ministry of Healing, page 472, and she speaks about this bird in a cage. And I'm going to read it for us and for the viewers that have read it. Um, you can just... Uh, follow me again. In the full light of day and in hearing of the music of other voices, the caged bird will not sing the song that his master seeks to teach him. He learns a snatch of this, a trill of that, but never a separate and entire melody. But the master covers the cage and places it where the bird will listen to the one song he is to sing. In the dark, he tries and tries again to, to sing that song until it is learned and he breaks forth in perfect melody. Then the bird is brought forth and ever after he can sing that song in the light. Thus God deals with his children. He has a song to teach us. And when we have learned it amid the shadows of affliction, we can sing it ever afterward. I don't know if, if that's, well, that's so beautiful to me. And then... The writer continues, notice that the one who carries the bird into the darkness is the master himself. It is easy to understand that Satan causes pain. But would God himself actively take part in guiding us into crucibles where we experience confusion or hurt? And that's the question. And so this week, as we go through the lesson, uh, we will look at it and it, the Bible says, what examples, or, or the lesson asks, what examples can you think in the Bible in which God himself leads people into experiences that he knows will include suffering? What do you think were the new songs he wanted them to sing? You know, stories told, and I'm going to just use that story as a, as a, as a springboard, but I want to share my own story with you that I've, I've um, come across on YouTube. So, um, as my sons were watching YouTube, I came across this one nursery rhyme that they were watching. And um, it's called Pete the Cat. And so Pete the Cat, he has shoes and he's got white shoes and he's very excited about his shoes, very um, proud of his white shoes. And he begins to sing a song. And the song goes like this. I like my white shoes. I like my white shoes. And he begins to sing the song. I like my white shoes. And Pete the Cat then 
get, goes into a, a strawberry farm and he comes out of the strawberry farm and his shoes are no longer white, but it is red. And Pete continues to sing, I love my red shoes. I love my red shoes. And then as Pete walks, Pete the cat, and he walks, he gets to a muddy road. And when he crosses the muddy road, he realizes that his shoes are no longer white, nor are they red, but they are brown. And Pete continues to sing, I love my brown shoes. I love my brown shoes. Now this is, and, 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 and the narrator then explains the moral of the story. He says throughout the experiences of Pete's life and Pete the cat's life, Pete never loses his song. He never loses his song. And many of us, we go through circumstances and through these circumstances and crucibles and trials, we tend to change our song. But Peter Cat adjusted to the situation and he kept singing the song. And so as we go through suffering and persecutions in our lives, this is what the lesson is all about, that we may continue to sing our song. With that in mind, we are going to go over to Sunday's portion of the lesson, which is going to be done by Pastor Chuchu. Let me let me greet the viewers and uh, the panelists in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I love how Pastor Nigel introduced the lesson uh, with 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 this uh, uh, animation, where this animal or this opit never loses his song, even though circumstances uh, changed, but 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 he never loses his song, but he embraced the circumstances that he find himself in. So, so, so I, I, that's what I, 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 I love the lesson of this story that in, in each and every circumstance we find ourselves, let the experience produce a new song, you know, and this song is a joyful song. I love my, though the experience changed, but, but, but the, 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 the song is a song of joy. So that that's what I'm I'm learning from 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 this experience. Now 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 Sunday says uh, to the promised land via a dead end. But before we go there, before we go there, uh, the author is asking serious questions. Uh, where he says that uh, the Bible, in which God Himself leads people into experiences that he knows will include suffering? That's a question. What do you think were the new songs he wanted them to sing? In other words, we tend to think that God, who is so loving, can never lead us to circumstances that are difficult. We tend to think that God, who is so caring, will never allow bad things to happen to us. You know, but, but, but the lesson gives a different dimension that God can lead us where we might be confused, can lead us where we might experience suffering. Actually, in this lesson, he can even lead us where we can experience betrayal, where we can experience frustration. He can lead us there. But the purpose of his leading is for us to have a new song. Now, when I read the lesson, the, the, the author is, is, is talking about Exodus 14, verse 10, where he says that, and when, the, when, when Pharaoh drew near to the children of Israel, when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptian marched after them. So they were a very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. This is something that we, we tend to, to, to blame at times the children of Israel. That when they, when they cried, 
you know, uh, that to, far, to, to, to Moses, when there no grave in Israel, that we are, we should perish. The, 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 the Bible says that when they saw the enemy coming and there was nowhere to run from the left to the right and there's a dead end, they cried where? To the Lord. They did not say, let us fight the, the, <laughs> the enemy. They cried to the person who was leading them to the promised land. Now, this brings back to what um, we previously heard of, 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 Joseph, of, of, of Paul. When Paul said that the, 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 the thorn in my flesh, Satan has caused this thorn. But where did he cry? He cried to God. You know, so that the beauty are that whenever God leads us into a dead end, we need to cry to him. So that's the beauty that, I, that, I, that, I've, that I've learned here. But the, 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 the author talks about an, another experience where he, he talks about, sometimes we don't complain about surprises that are good, where we are led to good surprises because they bring joy, they bring happiness. But when we are led to places of disappointment you know he even said that uh, he asked us a, a question at times it can be a quite shocking even a very unpleasant one it may have it may have been bullies when you were at school you know where god allowed bullies to come your way you know and 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 and, and, and make you feel small make you feel unworthy, make you feel unappreciated, you know? Uh, uh, you begin to question yourself. God allows that. He also goes and says that, or oh, a work colleague who unexpectedly tried to make you look bad. You know, at times we tend to want to clear our names. You know, want to clear our names, want to fight those who, who have caused a trap, caused a lie, you know, uh, mad our reputation, all those we try to, to fight. But, but, but the lesson here is showing a different dimension that God can allow certain traps, certain lies, you know, about you. But this is what I've learned. This is what I've learned uh, in, 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 in Minutes of Healing. I'm just going to uh, uh, read things that, are, that I've learned in Minutes of Healing. Uh, Elamite is saying there, under the topic, the discipline of trial. Sometimes we crucibles can serve a purpose of discipline. Crucibles can serve a purpose of discipline because some all can serve a purpose of refinement where we are being refined. There's a blind spot that we don't know of ourselves. Now, Elamite says that uh, the, the life... The, to live such a life, to, to, ex, to, ex, to exert such an influence, uh, costs at every step, effort, self-sacrifice, discipline. Okay, fine. Let me just say, let me just, let me just leave that one. He said, they, they pray for Christ, they pray for Christ-likeness of character, which is us Christians, for fitness, of, for, fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances under line. We are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil in their nature. God places us where all evil comes in our way. He goes on, faults are revealed of which they did not even suspect they exist like Israel of old. They question, if God is leading us, why do all these things come to us? Sometimes we are placed, we reach a dead end so that God can reveal in us some defects. God can reveal in us some shortcomings. The Israelites reach a dead end and, they will re and God revealed to them that you guys are not ready for the promised land. You know, you guys still have Egypt in mind. You guys still cherish, you know. Alan Wright goes on and says that it is because, this was a shocking statement to me, 
She said that it is because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Sometimes God leads us to areas where we find difficulties. Sometimes God leads us to areas where we find a shocking. But the intention is to purify us. Let me leave just in, in case, for, 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 for time's sake, let me skip others. I, I will come back later. And uh, this is another element that I read in, 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 the, in, 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 in here. Where, answering, uh, answering the question, he, he, Ellen Wright says that, actually the, 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 the writer, let me just go to the writer and then finish with this one. The writer says, why did God bring the Israelites to a place where he knew they would be terrified? So the, partially the answer was there. He lead them. Now, the author goes and he said, following the pillar does not assure us, does not assure us of constant happiness. Following God's God does not assure us of constant happiness. In other words, we will have set moments, but those set moments serve a purpose. He says, it only can be hard experience because training in righteousness takes us to places that test our hearts. So in other words, the purpose here for each and every circumstance we find ourselves it's a training for righteousness to be like Christ, to live a righteous life. So that's the purpose there that we find. She go, he go, the other goes on and says that during these difficult times, sorry, during these difficult times, the key to knowing when we are truly following God is not necessarily the absence of trial or pain, but rather an openness to God's instruction and a continual submission of our minds and our hearts to his leading. So I'm closing with this one when I connect. Ellen White says, once again to Minister of Healing, she says, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led. If they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. So all in all, whenever God leads us, wherever God leads us, even if it is a dead end, that dead end is intended to serve his purpose. That dead end is intended to purify, to refine us. That dead end is intended to make us like Christ. That dead end is intended to give honor and glory unto God. Is it going to be unpleasant? Yes. Is it going to be painful? Yes. Are we going to like it? We are not going to like it. But we should run to God who has allowed it and say, Lord, it is too much. I can't take it. But when we receive the answer that says my grace is insufficient, then we can say, I rejoice in suffering. I rejoice in tribulations because God's leading, God's leading brings about his provision of his presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. And I like those those quotations from Ellen White, I do think that is, it's powerful. I, I, and you know what? Um, I think we can read quote after quote this evening. Just one thing from, from Councils for the Church. Ellen White says, God tests those whom he values. The fact that we are called upon to endure trials proves that the Lord Jesus sees in us something very special. So I, I truly um, enjoyed the quotations and um, th 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 that was very comforting. One of the, the um, viewers are saying, powerful, Pastor Chuchu, powerful. Thank you so much. Let's go over to, to, to Monday's portion, Pastor Morning. Uh, please lead us into more no, Monday's portion of the section. <laughs> it's me. 
Not, What's the house? I've got it wrong. What's the house? What's the house? I always have you wrong. I don't know why it's with yeah. you. I'm sorry. Well, it's fine. It's fine. No, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Um, I think something that I've um, come to understand when we talk about suffering, there are two axiomatic concepts that we need to to uh, put down on the table and realize that we are working with this. Otherwise, nothing makes sense. And for me, that the fundamental concepts that we need to work with is God's faithfulness, but also God's suffering. Because all of these stories do not make sense if God is the one that leads us into these sufferings, but he is free from the hurt. He needs to be able to hurt with us or have gone th before us through these trials in order for this to not become some um, uh, sadistic exercise of God. And I think those are two fundamental concepts that we need to work with when we talk about suffering and specifically within the lesson. And, and I love this, this, this notion of not asking um, what is the meaning of suffering. Um, because I think sometimes we, we, we spend a lot of time on this. What's the meaning of suffering? You know, how do we make sense of all of this? But I love how this just changing one word, what is the meaning in suffering? And I think that's what we have talked about um, thus far, is, is not so much making sense of, of the, the why and um, how does it work and all of these things, but realizing the fact that there is suffering, irrespective of if I am part of the remnant or if I'm an unbeliever, um, suffering is, is, is basically what there is on this earth. And I think that we need to also take into consideration when we read portions of scripture where it's, or um, from, from Ellen White uh, under the spirit of prophecy, where she the, uses these, these, these words of, of God leading us into suffering. It, it's, it's not so much that God creates the suffering, and then he takes us towards it. The fact of the matter is he's leading us and there will be suffering. So when he's leading us, he will lead us through suffering. Um, and that becomes clear when we look at the Exodus journey. When we look at the Exodus chapter 15 and we find that they are now on their way. They've gone through the Red Sea. They become thirsty because they're in the desert. They come to a point where there is a well. It's not like God created Mara. <laughs> just for the Israelites. So when they get there, there's it's already there. The bitter water is already there. They are on their way to the fulfillment of, of getting to the promised land. The suffering is there, um, but he's with them. And therefore, when they come to this, this um, place where the water is bitter, um, the nation becomes angry. They don't understand what is happening, or at least, you know, they, they doubt a little again. Um, as they would do many more times. But Moses steps in, God gives him the answer, you know, this tree, throw it into the water, and the water becomes of such a nature. Now, it's important to note that um, this is not the end. They, 20 kilometers further, they get to Elam. And Elam is known for the fact that it has 12 wells and 70 palm trees. It's abundance. Um, and I think that's also important to, to recognize within our um, concept of suffering and God leading, that being faithful to God doesn't just mean crucibles. <laughs> um, on this way, we will have the 12 wells and we will have the 70 palm trees. Um, we are not called to be flogging ourselves in misery the whole time in order to, to show God that we are worthy and to purify and um, and I think sometimes we fall into that pit as well. We have this, this, um, and it, it all comes back to this, this image of that we have of God. And that's why I say we need to work with those two fundamental concepts in the beginning. That, that uh, it is not that we are trying to find, you know, some meaning towards suffering, but it's meaning in suffering. And, and I like this because if, if, we, if it's the first, the former, we place the suffering one place or myself in it and God outside of it. But when we say in suffering and we acknowledge that God in suffering and faithfulness, he's standing with us in this bubble. And I have illustrated it, but uh, I can't show it now, share the screen. But but I think that, that to me was uh, good. Um, and then, yeah, so let me go on. Then we get to <coughs> Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. 
So they're on the way to Sinai. And they, this is important. They, they're on their way to Sinai. Um, we recognize what happened at Sinai. It was the Ten Commandments that were handed out. Um, we know that this wasn't the first time that God's character was revealed to his nation. Um, we know Abram kept the Sabbath. Abram, um, uh, even before that, um, the, these, these basic principles of God's kingdom was already in place. But we need to recognize the context of the Israelites at this stage. 430 years of a, a, a paradox in their faith, if I can put it like that. Having a God that is Yahweh, um, that is present, but 430 years of his absence. And I think it's beautiful that God comes here and he doesn't neglect that he's accountable for them. He says, I'm going to start over. I am going to start a process of reconciliation. Rehabilit not, yeah, reconciliation, but I like to use more of a rehabilitation. And you see this is what God is doing. So, so it's these moments of suffering that we term as that um, actually are moments of rehabilitation, of working that trust thing, because God is faithful. <laughs> we are not so much. And in these moments of suffering, his faithfulness are revealed. And it can only be significant if we have put our trust in him and that and being trustworthy with, with the trust that he has given us. And in that working, the body becomes stronger. For 430 years, this body had accident after accident. And God steps in through this journey in the wilderness um, and he teaches them his song again. And that to me is beautiful. And, and one of the things that... that uh, um, yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, 430 years is absence. The, so the body underwent a, a major trauma, and this is then there. Then, then we get to Refidim. I think that's how you pronounce it. My Hebrew has been outdated for a while now. <laughs> um, and that's about 25 kilometers from Sinai. And we recognize that again, this is a moment in which the nation of Israel um, are thirsty. And it's, it's clear. Um, but this time God uses another example. And I think it's, it's quite clear when you take this whole picture and you recognize that it is not one instance, but that it is part of a, a, a journey that God is on with his nation. That he's teaching them something new in this hit the rock and there will be water flowing from there. Um, we know that there's a lot that has been written on the significance of that and uh, the, the, the significance towards Christ and, and what he means for us. Um, so, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, now, the question that I'm, I've asked myself, it's good to know all of these theological um, snippets. It's good to recognize these, these concepts and, and feel, but what does it mean for the person that is really struggling, that's really going through suffering? And one thing that I, I need to reiterate this, that suffering is not reserved for the faithful few. Um, I, I've worked long enough in, in, in a setting where you have all faiths coming through, all non-faith specific or, or unbelievers or whatever you can, and cancer looks the same for each one of them. Um, losing a child at two weeks looks the same for each one of them. And, and I think that we need to recognize that. What, um, what we need to then ask ourselves, but what, what, what makes it different that we can say that God is with us, within the suffering? With us, and and I love how um, one of the professors um, uh, in pastoral care, and it's it's quite significant when when Pastor Chuchu read from Ministry of Healing. Um, it I've picked it up so many times that a lot of the the, the academic resources out there, um, I don't know if they borrowed from Ellen White. Did they had to because it's long before they 
uh, these books were written that Ellen White has already grasped these concepts through the spirit of prophecy. Um, so, so we are thankful for, for these books. But uh, when it comes to, to the actual role that we as pastors have to play in teaching or shepherding through pastoral care to, towards uh, our members that are undergoing suffering. And I love how this is put. It says the objective of pastoral care in suffering is to sustain the patient in discovering the meaningful implications of the suffering God's self-involvement. So it is basically being a, a well of fresh water for somebody that is undergoing um, this journey through the wilderness. Not so much that we are going to give them the answers, because I, I love I mentioned it in a previous um, recording that suffering does not demand an answer; it demands a presence. And and I think in this sense we we recognize that. It is about this person's journey with their God. And, and sometimes we want to give them the right answer. But sometimes there isn't. Sometimes we just have to allow them to live in that paradox. And allow God to, to reveal. Sometimes it might even be 20 years later. That the penny drops of why I went through that. Um, but what the person will remember is the way in which they were supported the way in which um, there was still acceptance, the way in which there was um, guidance during this time. And I think for, for me, that, that is what uh, the bitter waters, <laughs> they are there. Um, but God allows us to, um, through our support, through the guidance, to, to change these waters into something that's refreshing, that can help us to get um, to, to, to the next pit stop, but even greater than that is to remember that there's also the, the elims on our way, the 12 wells and the 70 palm trees. Um, we can enjoy life, even in the suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, wow, that was, that was beautiful. I, I, I think our, our viewers are also on fire this, this evening. And I think they're sharing some... some let, me, let me share with you, Stella. Um, a regular viewer, uh, maybe you can um, just say amen after you, you read this. She says, God can lead us to what seems to be a dead end to us, but actually not a dead end to him. God in himself has no dead end. Uh, look at this. Uh, Yonela says, if we could see the end from the beginning, we would not choose to be led any differently let us trust god powerful um i don't know if there are any other viewers i mean or panelists that would like to respond to um, monday's portion um if not let's let's go over to tuesday's portion and i think it it brings about a similar question because in tuesday's portion of the lesson we have um jesus uh, starting in, in uh, you know, being baptized and then after he's baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible now says, and, and look at this, maybe you can help me to understand what is actually being said here. It says in Luke chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, and this is the great controversy in the desert, the title for Tuesday's portion of the lesson. It says, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, right, so he's filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and, this is it, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days and uh, by the devil. I think it should be clear by now that the, the God does not tempt. I mean, when we go to the book of James, I'm just, I don't know, I can't remember where it's, I think James chapter 1 verse 13. The Bible tells us that, that, that God cannot tempt. And so now, what do we do with this verse right here when it says that Jesus was led into the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted any of you uh, panelists can you assist pastor carolus um maybe maybe i can just uh, point back to uh monday's section and and especially uh, uh and sunday's section as well remember when the israelites was led by god they were led by the pillar of fire right by night and by day it was there so god was there 
He led them all the way. And, and, and this is one thing that we must remember. God leads us in a certain way because he needs us to go in a certain way. And he needs us to learn something. Now, now this is very strange for us when we look at um, Jesus being led by the Spirit because we know Jesus is also God, right? 100% God, 100% man. But at this stage, he had to be led so that we also can learn lessons and so that we also can see how the Spirit can lead us and how we can stand against the temptations. Um, I don't know if you want me to continue with this because you started the day. You can continue with it. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, Pastor Shoshul, you want to come in there quickly before we go back yes. to, to Pastor? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, I just want to throw it, uh, something. You know, there are times whereby uh, when we are in such uh, um, terrible condition, right, where you don't see or understand that God understands you. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm, I'm able to, you know, where you see that you, you, you can't tr truly understand. I like what Pastor Ho says that sometimes allow someone to experience that. You know, once they experience that, they will truly discover who God is. Pastor Blosse, when he when he preaches on 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 Job, he condemned the Job's friends, you know, for condemning Job to ask questions to God, you know, to really want, you know, he 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 goes he goes on and says that Job experienced, but at the end, who was rewarded? It was Job. He even said that sometimes we condemn Job's wife. You know, we vilify Job's wife, but nothing was said by God towards Job's wife. But it was his friends who defended God. Are we together? So I, 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 I enjoyed uh, his sermon when he when he preached there. But to your question, come to your question, Mfundiswam, is, is this. Um, the, the, the author is saying here, um, God, God never tempts us, right? Rather, as we have been seeing, God does lead us to crucible of testing. This is where I've underlined. What is striking, this is the author, what is striking in Luke 4 is that the Holy Spirit can lead us Yes. Okay, Pastor Chu Chu, I think if it might just be me, I might be wrong, but I think mm -hmm. your video is is uh, intermittent. Uh, I think let's 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 go to. Um, okay, okay. I think we, you know, dealing with Tuesday's lesson, I. I you know, there's there's a verse or uh, that that just sticks out to me and stands out to me is the the in found in Isaiah chapter forty three verse two, because to me God does not just lead us, but there are numerous occasions where we hear that God leads us through, not just into or uh, like 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 you have this um, interpretation of of Jesus being led uh, by the Spirit, but He le leads us through it through the wilderness. And when we go to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, this is powerful, right? It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And maybe we don't understand. Let me just explain this quickly. Like, for an example, if here's a house, if this is a house, right? And uh, I'm coming into the house, right? So I'm moving into the house. That's when now I am in the house. I'm coming into the house. I'm in the house. When I leave this house, if this is the house and I leave it, I can safely say that I've walked through the house. Do you understand that? So if this is the house, I'm walking into the house and I've walked, when I leave the house, I've walked through the house. And throughout scripture, Christ doesn't just say he, lead us, uh, he leads us, or he, I mean, uh, you know, he, he's with us in, but he, the Bible says he goes through it. In other words, we, 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 yes, it may seem that oh, we are going through tribulations and trials, 
but God assures us that we will reach the other side safely. You know, um, David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, D David is already uh, accepting that God is going to bring him out victorious. I don't know if that makes sense. But uh, let me just finish Isaiah chapter 43 and we can go over to, to, to Wednesday's portion of this and, uh, because I see uh, Wednesday's um, panelist is very excited to go ahead. But Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2 says, when you pass through the waters, right? Not just when you are in the waters, when you pass through it, he says, I will be with you. So what, what God is really saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to lead you through this, not just into it, but through it. Uh, it says, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And when God speaks about us as the remnant church and the remnant people, what does he say? Right? These are they who have come through great tribulation. And so God doesn't just, here we have an instance where it says, you know, in, but, but God really takes us through it. And so I don't think we need to worry about where we're in tribulation and because God promises that he's going to take us through it outside of the house. I hope that makes, makes sense. That just gives me so much comfort that when I'm going through trials, I'm not, go, I'm not in a trial. I'm going through the trial. I'm, I'm already going by God's grace. He's taking me through this. And that is the words that Christ used. And I thought uh, the Bible uses. And I think that was just powerful. Let's go to Wednesday's portion of the lesson. Pastor Chuchu, before we go to Wednesday, did you, we, we missed you there. Did you say something profound? Would you like to repeat it? Yes, I just wanted to read what, what the author was saying because this here is it's something that is that that is very much interesting. Right? Just want to read it. He he goes, I'm not sure where, but he, he said that uh, at at such times when we feel these temptations so strongly, we may misunderstand and think we have not been following God correctly. But this is not necessarily true. She, he goes on and quote and writes that often when placed in a trying situation, we doubt that the spirit of God has been leading us. But it was the spirit's leading that brought Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. When God brings us into trial, he has a purpose to accomplish for our good. Jesus did not presume on God's promises by doing unbidden into temptation. Neither did, neither did he give up, neither did he give up upon him, nor we should. The last point, he says, sometimes when in crucible, we get bent rather than being purified. You know, it is therefore very comforting to know that when we, are cr we crumble under temptation, we can have hope that Jesus stood firm. There is a hope when we fall into temptation. Fall, we have this hope that Jesus stood firm for our, 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 on our behalf. The good news is that we have a savior, our sin bearer, because he paid the penalty of sin, penalty of failure to endure temptation because he went through a crucible worse than any of us will ever face. We are not cast off or forsaken by God. This is hope even for the chief of sin. So to me, whether we there is hope that Jesus, who went through a crucible much more than us, we are able to stand. That's the portion that I wanted to, to share. Thank you for highlighting that, Pastor Chuchu. Pastor Karolis, Nigel, please uh, go share with us Wednesday's portion of the lesson. Good evening and happy Sabbath, everyone. I uh, looked at this lesson and it's, uh, it's not easy. It's quite difficult because it calls us to, to reflect on our personal experience. And when you read the text that's been mentioned there, 1 Peter and verses 6 and 7, something that stands out when when you read it there is something that peter inserts in the middle of the text so he says in this greatly rejoice even thou for a little while and then he puts these two words there if necessary you have been distressed by various trials that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable 
even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's right in the middle there, if necessary. And so the question becomes then, are all these trials necessary? So last year, we had 24 funerals. I remember I conducted 24 funerals, and they all had to do with COVID. And so there was one week where there were three people that passed away. <clears throat> and there was one week that there were three funerals. And so the question that comes is, was it necessary for them to perish? And that's the question that the families had. What, was it necessary? Because you, you come with these texts, and, and they are meant to encourage, but at that moment, it seems as though God is silent. Is it necessary? Peter's saying, if necessary, it will come, and it has this purpose. And he says that it has this purpose, but you should also re rejoice. Now, none of us can rejoice in, in, in suffering. None of us. None of us. But the Bible gives us an example of what it looks like. So when you go to, to the Acts of the Apostles, which is one of the most powerful books written there, you see Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, and they are in prison. And so they're in prison for Christ's sake. And so in prison, they were singing songs. And that goes to them never losing their song, Pastor Eugene. No matter what the circumstance, like beat the cat, they never lost their song. And they busy singing, even though they've been beaten, they did nothing wrong, they in the deeper section of, of, of the prison. And they're singing songs to God. And the Bible says that everyone heard the songs, and uh, there was an earthquake, and you know what happens when you, when you hear a song that you like. You, you, you go and you tap and you clap hands to the beat of the song. And someone once said that perhaps God enjoyed the song so much that he stepped, tapped his feet and then the earth began to shake. And that's how the earthquake happened and no one perished. But that's a picture of, of rejoicing in a trial where you're able to sing a song even though you're in the heat of the suffering because they haven't been released yet. And that's what the biblical writers are teaching us. And, and when you go to the book of Job, you see that Job says in the middle of his suffering, even though he slay me. Yet I will trust him. And so we've got this tension. Yes, we've, we've got the encouraging words of Peter. Yes, these writers are all dead, but they're speaking to us. Yes, we know that they're speaking to us um, in the midst of their suffering. So that should draw encouragement. But we've still got the tension. We've, we've got this God who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, is all-present, who is able to deliver. But the tension comes is he doesn't. And that's the tension that people have. He, he's all-powerful. He can do this, but he doesn't. He doesn't deliver. And the tension that, that remains there is, why does this, this God who is able to, to remove this, why does he not do that? Is, is cancer necessary for someone to experience? Is it necessary for someone to see their child being knocked down in front of their home by a speeding a uh, person who's, who's, who's drunk. Is it necessary for, for people to, to go through these, these difficult things, according to Peter? But what we see from the Bible is that, yes, we may be in an unbelievably, unimaginably painful place right now, bad place right now. But the encouragement that Peter gives us is that this is not your last place. It might be bad right now, this place, but it's not your last place. It's not your last place. And that's the promise that he gives us. That even though we are in this place right now, God has not left. Because we have a God who always seeks to plant himself in our presence. And so when Jesus comes to this earth the first time, he, he enters, not the world, but he enters into our pain. And that's why he knows what we are going through. And so the encouragement that we get that Peter says that rejoice gladly because if necessary, this will produce something and gold will, will stand the test of time. And you have this hope, you've got these promises. And then he says, look at my life. And so you go to the last words of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, 18. He says, beware that you don't fall away, that you lose your steadfastness, but continue to grow in the knowledge 
and grace of Jesus Christ our Savior. And that's his last words. That's the last we hear of him. And when you go to the Desire of Ages, you know, the faithful apostle, the chapter on Peter, it states there that Peter, even in his last moments, he could never forgive himself for the betrayal of Jesus Christ. And even in the midst of his suffering, when he was about to die, he wasn't thinking about death. He was thinking about the manner and how unworthy he was. And he says, I'm not even worthy to be crucified in the same way as my Savior. Rather, let's do it upside down. And so he could be joyful in his suffering. Because he's been suffering all along. But he knew that God never left him. And may this hope be that as we perhaps are suffering right now, that we will also come to the place where we realize that this might be a bad place now. The shepherd is leading us. So this is not our last place. He's leading us. And going back to that lesson where, where we started with the crucible, you know, the, David, David writes and he says, even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, the shadow can only exist if there's light. So where's the light coming from? It's coming from the shepherd. Shadow cannot exist. There's no light. The fact that there's light there in that valley means that there's hope. So let's, let's continue to trust God. Let's be joyful in our trials, realizing that it might be bad right now, but this is not our last place. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you so much. And I know there are of viewers, you know, and I mean, we are panelists. We also, you know, go through, go through crucibles in life. And I, I believe we were touched by um, that summation of, of, of Wednesday's lesson. I'm going to go over to Thursday, and at the end of Thursday's lesson, I'm going to ask maybe if, if you would like to say something, you know, just keep it brief, one or two words. But because of time, we're going to go to Thursday's portion of the lesson. And then after that, if there's anyone who'd like to comment, can just keep it till then. Pastor Furstenberg. Thank you, Pastor Carolus, and good evening to all our viewers out there. Um, Thursday is... Um, is, is basically what it comes down to. Um, it, the first time when I read this portion of the lesson, it's like, I don't know what to do with it. But it is at the end of the Thursday because it is actually giving us advice on from Sabbath, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday part of the lesson study. And now we have learned... And this is the implementation part of what we have learned. Now, I don't know if we are always that good. We are good with learning and giving verses, but I, I, I somehow wonder if we are that good by implementation. Now, I don't want to read the whole story. It's about Alex, and he had four problems. Um, we, we, it was somebody out in the world, he, he came into the world, he accepted Christ, and all of a sudden there was four things going wrong. And I want to say it was a modern day Job. Because if we look at Job, we will see he got four tidings. You know what happened to him. Now, now Alex also had four problems. And I think um, as uh, theology students, um, I think maybe sometime or another, all of us suffered some of these things here. Um, and even today, um, some of our viewers may suffer them. There's, there's money problems. There's somebody that turned against you. There's sickness that happened that, that, that we cannot um, fathom. And, um, and, and then there is... Uh, Beyond all these things, then there's temptations that, that comes our way. And if I go back to Tuesday's uh, uh, part of the lesson on the temptations, a temptation is there. A temptation is not sin. If we fall for the temptation, that is the sin. But we do have the choice not to fall for the temptation. Now, if I go on and in the middle of that page, there is a question. And the question says, imagine that amid the crisis, Alex comes to you and asks for advice. Now, we always want to be people 
who wants to give advice. But I'm wondering, now you're experiencing what this person is going through. You know, the lesson doesn't say here, just give them a Bible verse. Because like, like Pastor Nigel said, it, you know, sometimes Bible verses seems very, um, if I can say it in that, when you're going through the crucible, very hollow. So it actually has to mean something when you give it. And, and, and the way we give Bible verses to people will mean something to them. But we can only share what we have experienced. Now, it goes on and it say, what would you say? What experience of your own have you had that could help someone like him? Now, now, um, I like what uh, Pastor Eugene was telling about the story. Now, I'm, I, I know we're on air, so I'm not going to name um, the film that um, many of us maybe have watched. But there was a little blue character in this story. And this character said one thing when she was confused. Keep on swimming. Now, if there's a tide, we must keep on swimming. If you stop swimming, a little fish will drown. So we need to keep on swimming. We need to keep on moving in our spiritual faith. If we just stop... Um, we will get drowned by everything around us and we will be consumed by everything around us. So that will be my advice. Keep on doing the things that you need to do. You know, um, this, this, I always tell this little story of, of little, let's call him Jimmy, he was with his granddad and granddad was reading the Bible. And Jimmy was reading the Bible. But after three or four days, he said to granddad, I do not understand it. And granddad said to him, Take the basket where the coals are in, where we make fire, the coals, and go fetch us some water. And Jimmy was looking at his granddad like, this is crazy. But he went to the water with the basket, got some water, come up there, no water in the basket. And he said, granddad, and granddad said, go back. So he goes back. Granddad says, walk faster. You know, every time there's no water in the basket. And after about five times, he ran. He's tired when he gets there and he says, Granddad, I do not get it. Granddad said to him, how does the basket look? All of a sudden, it was clean. Sometimes we do not know what it will do for us, but we need to keep on doing it um, regularly. You know, if it feels like to you, um, some old lady said to my wife one day, when you feel like you're praying and your prayer doesn't go higher than the ceiling, don't worry. God is not higher than the ceiling. He's there with you. So if, if it feels like to us, if we read the Bible and it doesn't make sense and it doesn't make it, it's okay. You're going through a crucible. As long as you do it because it will cleanse you, it will lead you to a time. So for our viewers out there that are going through through crucibles, keep on doing the things that you know as a Christian, because we are speaking to Christians here. Now, it goes on to the next one. And um, I've got here, and uh, the question says, what will you say to people? What text will you bring to people? One of the first texts that comes to mind is Joshua 1 verse 9. Don't fear. Just go through. Just go through with what you have. I am with you. Then the other one, Pastor Eugene, you used it. Isaiah 43. You will go through the waters. It's okay. You go through it. You will get to the other side. Go through the fire. It will not burn you. Just go through it. Then um, there's another one which I want to quickly share with you if I can open it quickly enough. It says Psalm 91. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Thank you, Pastor Nigel. There must be light if there's a shadow. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So when we go through these things, we need to tell people to keep on trusting, to keep on believing. 
you know some people just say uh, um trust seeing is believing you know uh, but but sometimes it's dark and when it is dark you know i like a dark room when i sleep at night i can wait i know exactly where everything is there i can open my eyes but i can't see a thing but i trust and i know that everything is there where i have left it and and we need to trust that god is still our refuge and our and our fortress as we go through life you know and another good example i think you used that one comes from um, job you know and we have all read those words but i want to read it again to us i think the 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 word of the lord is very powerful uh, job 1 verse 21 and 22 it says he said naked i came from my mother's womb and naked i shall return there the lord gave and the lord has taken away now here comes the words blessed be the name of the lord he uh, let's let's just get one thing straight job wasn't happy because the lord took everything away but he said i will trust in the lord if there's blessings or if there's crucibles i will trust in the lord and then then there's my favorite my favorite verse um we we find that in second corinthians i shouldn't say my favorite um we've got lots of favorites second corinthians um if i can just open my bible there chapter one verse three and four paul is writing here he says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ the father of mercies and god of all comfort then he goes on, who comforts us in our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So here Paul says to us, how are we helping others that goes through crucibles? You must remember your crucible, how you uh, felt in that situation. Then we will be able to stand with other people. You know, we will not just do this, um, let me not say Christian thing. We will not just do this thing and say, my brother, my sister, I will pray for you. Prayer is good. We should do that. But it should go beyond prayer that we also are there for them in their affliction. And, and this is the thing. All of us are pastors. We all sit with, with members, parishioners that go through these crucibles. And are we just saying nice words to them or are we actually helping them go through it, keeping their faith? Um, we, uh, we can go through those verses. Uh, sorry, Pastor Carolus. Uh, give me another two minutes. Um if we go through those verses at the end of that question, Proverbs 3, you know, Proverbs 3 says, we, if we understand, um, and we read that in, um, let me just find it here where I have written it down. Um, we must understand God if we go through these trials. We must see God in everything and that it will help us to be better. We see a crucible as we are burning. Um, we are in the hot water. But God sees that it is something that will make us better. So if we can understand what God is understanding, it is so much easier to go through it. Um, if we go through some of the others, Romans 8 verse 28, um, we must turn our pain into a purpose. I think from uh, one of our previous panelists said that we our pain should be a purpose. It should not be purposeless. Um, if I go through pain, it should mean something not only to me, but also to somebody else. Then we will see people having their faith. Yes, maybe they will they will feel neglected for a while by God while they are going through the crucible. We all ask questions, but. As soon as the crucible is there and we look back, we will see that God is always been with us. I like that story of the pillar 
um, of, of fire that was with them. I like that the Holy Spirit on Tuesday's part went, not only took Jesus into the wilderness, but he was there with him all the time in the wilderness. So Christ is there with us all the time. If we can see him, if we can feel him, if we can hear him, that does not matter. He is always there. And because he's there, we will be able to go through that matter. I, I do hope that on Thursday's part, we will start implementing these lessons in our lives so that we also can help others. I thank you, Pastor Carolus. Thank you so much. I'm going to give each of you a, a, a one word or at least one sentence to, to, to if, if you would like to share. And I like, I'm just going to come back to 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4 who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with comfort we ourselves receive from the Lord. And I think that's so powerful. I think that sums it up because when we speak about the comfort and God giving comfort, uh, us comfort in our trials and through our trials, uh, God actually wants to use others or God wants to use us. When we see others going through difficult times, God wants to use us to assist him to bring comfort to those who are in in difficult times. So I think this is this has been a beautiful lesson. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Is there someone else who'd like to share? Just unmute and give me a sentence. Yes, Pastor Jose. Thank you. And I, and I love that um of the example that Pastor Nigel used with with um Saul and Silas, um or Paul, or Paul and Silas, um, because they rejoicing, the freedom that they um experienced in in the and chained and um, prison walls falling over um, was an indictment on the prison guard. He was ready to fall on his sword. And we know that he had a family. So there was a breadwinner gone. There was somebody that was just doing their job. And I think that's where the difference comes in if, if we... Actually saying, but what, what can I do with the suffering? I'm in it. The Lord is with me. Um, what is it that I can do with this suffering? And and that's often the difference between the person that, that succumbs to the illness, an illness in, in various ways, um, and, and the person that overcomes. Um, and sometimes the, the overcoming is not necessarily in, in being healed from the physical ailment, but it is the quality of those last moments. And then I think that is asking ourselves, what do I do with the suffering? I am in it. It's, it's not that the God is, is now, you know, I am in it. What can I do with it? And eventually that family was saved um, and they became very important for the gospel in that area. Pastor Carolus, I, I think you just need to unmute. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thanks for that, Pastor Jose. I think um, Pastor Nigel would just like to give a sentence. And then we'll go over to Pastor, uh, Pastor Furstenberg just to give us a verse. Yeah, now my comment is with uh, regard to this. There's this theme in the Bible that you find... Uh, it's actually a time period called the fourth watch of the night and you see it it's actually mentioned in matthew chapter 14 and and it's the story where jesus walks on water and 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 guess who also walks with him peter uh, uh during the fourth watch of the night and that's that's the darkest time that's between 3 a.m and 6 a.m it's, it's totally dark it, it represents that period where you can't see in front of you but that's that's the time when when he's delivered, uh, you, you find this throughout the Bible. Jacob wrestles with God during the fourth watch of the night. Uh, Moses actually leads the Israelites to the Red Sea during the fourth watch of the night. You can see Daniel, he, the Persian king, checks on him during the Den of the Lion episode during the fourth watch of the night. And and, and, and Jesus himself is resurrected in the fourth watch of the night. And, and there's this chapter in, in the Great Controversy that says that when when we are delivered when when christ finally comes it is just after the darkest hour and so there is this hope that we have 
that even though we can't see in front of us, you're in the fourth watch, but there's hope. Um, Pastor Carolus, for time's sake, if I can bring that verse, and we found it in the lesson study. Very easy to remember. 14, 14. And it comes from Exodus, and that is, and, and, and I want to read it in context, not out of context. It says, the Lord will fight for you. So if you go through the crucible, don't worry, the Lord will fight for you. And we can see it is, it is here where the Israelites were pursued by the Egyptians. But they were murmuring and they were complaining also about why Moses took them here. And going through a crucible, we, we sometimes want to just moan and complain and, and, and have grudges. And, and it's wonderful words. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Because as soon as we become silent, we can. it's, it's like that bird in the cage. We can hear the Lord's voice much more. So sometimes let's keep quiet and listen to God's voice. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, panelists. And thank you so much for um, tuning in, viewers. And, um, you know, these are reminders, these verses, we need to be reminded, even though um, it needs to sometimes be explained. Um, and these verses, we know them, but it's good to know that um, they, it's still alive and still relevant to our hearts. Thank you so much, um, panelists, and, and, and allowing God to use you in such a mighty way this evening. I truly appreciate it. Um, we're going to close in prayer. I'm going to ask Pastor Shalom if you can just close in prayer for us. And then after that, we'll see you next week, same time and same place. Let us close our eyes in prayer. Our kind and heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the assurance of your presence in the midst of our crucibles. We thank you, dear God, for that when you have led us through the crucibles, your presence is with us. We thank you, dear Father, for knowing that you don't cause them, but dear Father, you make them to fulfill your purpose. Thank you for suffering with us, and thank you, dear Father, for sympathizing and empathizing with us. One thing we know, dear Father, and we pray for, is strength in the midst of crucibles. We pray, dear Father, that you give us faith not to lose focus, but to look and to run to you when things don't make sense. Give us, dear Father, the assurance of your presence with through your Holy Spirit that you give us comfort at all times. Bless each and every listener who was listening to this lesson. Some of them, dear Father, may be experiencing so much at this moment. Probably some of them don't understand the reason why they still have to believe in you. But at this point in time, dear Father, may you reveal yourself. May you show your presence so that at the end of the day, dear Father, your name may be glorified. And help us to have a different experience of knowing you through these crucibles. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless. And uh, when we, we will see each other next.